I, I guess I should give a brief introduction. Uh, so it's a great honor, really, to have Joe Feldstein come here. He was one of the first names I encountered when I came to this campus as a, a new graduate student, written there above the teacups, Feldstein Zone. It, it took six months before I learned that had anything to do with Long Branch attraction. Uh, it wasn't just the name of our little cafe there. Uh, I had the honor to meet Joe Feldstein at Evolution last year. And uh, the fortune to, to give a talk right before his and watch all of these people come in to see my last slide. <laughs> I learned this is called the Felsenstein effect at the evolution meetings. So during my orals, I was describing a likelihood calculation when we sort of move up the tree. And one of my committee members reminded me, you remember this is called the, the Joe Felsenstein printing algorithm. Joe, Joe, we wanted to first to remind you that uh, the computer scientist called a peeling algorithm 10 years before, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so I should have known that Felsenstein would have such a central role in my career as I was born in the year of Felsenstein. In, in 1985, uh, this paper that sort of launched the field of comparative methods. Uh, this is a paper that's so cited that people write papers about how much this paper is cited. <laughs> So anyway, with no further ado, we're all ready to hear what Joe has to show us for the next directions of biogenetics. Thank you. I'll try to stand here and not move because this thing is pointing at me. Um, I um, am honored to give the uh, Storer lecture, and I was thinking about, uh, I sort of looked up Storer, and I was thinking, that name sounds familiar. Um, and then I remembered that as far as I can tell, my um, elementary biology course in uh, the University of Wisconsin in 1960 used Storer's book, so maybe there is a connection. Uh, I, I cannot say I learned my biology from it because I already knew some biology by then. Uh, am I showing up on the mic? I am, okay. Um, what I wanted to do is give you one of those talks that you've heard a lot of where Somebody comes through and they talk about three things they've been doing lately in their lab, and around it they spin a totally bogus framework, <laughs> which makes out to, to, to define the central problem for biology in our time that just happens to be satisfied by these three projects that they just happen to have been working on in their lab. So I'm going to you know, with that warning, uh, there is a little aspect of this, but I think the uh, work will hold together. I'll necessarily have to whiz rather quickly through a lot of it. Um, and the, the, the title is Statistical Non-Molecular Phylogenetics. Can Molecular Phylogenetics Illuminate Morphological Evolution? Obviously, the answer is going to be yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here giving the talk. And uh, what I want to do is, uh, to tell you a little bit about situations in which we have a molecular phylogeny. And this molecular phylogeny uh, is assumed to be pretty perfect, fairly, fairly good. Uh, it really tells you what the uh, divergence uh, times and uh, the topology, tree topology for the group is. We also have quantitative character data or other types of morphological data. And the question is, how can you um, make those work together with the molecular phylogeny? Now, we know that for comparative method studies, people have been doing that for a long time, as Carl mentioned. Um, and uh, that seems to be something that people actually want to do. I'm going to talk about um, three extensions of that kind of framework. One of them is the situation where your data are not just um, morphological measurements but are uh, a morphological form, a morphometric form, analyzed by morph morphometric methods. The second will be when you have fossil data on fossil species that are not, um, for which you don't have any, mo uh, any molecular data, but those fossil species are inside of a group or where you have present day species um, with molecular data and morphological data. And the question will be, how can you figure out where those fossils hook into the phylogeny? And the third problem will be, can you make models for discrete morphological characters that are 0, 1, but that work together with the continuous morphological characters? So with that, with that sort of uh, framework, let me start out by saying that the, the central 
um, model that most people use for the evolution of morphological characters, say measurable characters, on a phylogeny is a Brownian motion model. Um, and you're basically saying that any given scale that you measure, if you follow it through time on a lineage, it will wander back and forth on its scale according to some kind of Brownian motion process with some variance through time. If you have multiple characters, you're going to have different rates of change in the different characters. And furthermore, they're going to co-vary with each other in, in a way that you have to infer. Um, you don't know in advance. There'll be some kind of, of correlations among their uh, Brownian motion. So it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of colored Brownian motion. It's co-varying Brownian motion. And that will be the, the sort of central model uh, that people uh, are using. Uh, the use of Brownian motion models for quantitative characters started out um, with the case of gene frequencies in the 1960s by Anthony Edwards and Luca Cavalli Sforza, who wrote a tremendously pioneering papers on the inference of phylogenies. They introduced the first parsimony method, they introduced the first likelihood method, um, and they almost introduced the first distance matrix method, but they waited three years to publish that and Walter Fitch had slightly scooped them by the time that they, uh, that they did. But in their work, they approximated the change of gene frequencies through time. It, uh, these are gene frequencies in human populations by approximating it by Brownian motion, which it isn't exactly because gene frequencies are on a scale of 0 to 1, whereas Brownian motion is on an infinite sc a scale that's infinite in all directions. Um, I later expanded the model to uh, model quantitative characters determined by those genes, uh, that's not very much of a jump. Um, and, but the person who really made um, the mod, used the Brownian motion model most effectively uh, was this guy, Russ Landy, uh, who was recently at University of California, San Diego, but now he's at Imperial College uh, in Britain. And Russ in the 1980s wrote a series of very pioneering papers. Uh, in the late se sorry, in the late seventies on into the early eighties, um, in which he took quantitative genetics of uh, the field of the the uh, genetics of quantitatively measurable characters important in animal and plant breeding, um, and he said, let's apply it to natural populations, and let's make some methods that will be usable for analyzing natural population quantitative characters, and he used as his central uh, rather daring approximation is something that, that when you think about it is a little scary. He said, let's assume that the quantitative genetic model for a bunch of characters holds for millions of years and that we can analyze uh, chain, long term changes in lineages or divergence of lineages uh, and put this in a quantitative genetic framework. And it was actually a very daring thing to do. And his models of how much variation would be maintained long term in quantitative characters by balances between mutation and optimizing selection have been uh, central results for evolutionary quantitative genetics. Um, when you have characters changing up a lineage and co-varying with each other, so that you have uh, length and width co-varying, or rather trivially. Well, everybody can see that one of the major sources of that covariation is genetic covariances. That basically there will be genetic variations, say simply ones that make the organism larger, that will affect both of those traits uh, in a correlated way. And uh, so if you see covariances or correlations between characters, you're likely to say, oh yeah, that's genetic covariation. But not so fast because there's another source of covariation and it's very important to keep it in mind. I have been howling in the wilderness about this for over 20, for almost 25 years saying, look folks, you've got to understand this. I have not noticed much reaction yet. Um, there's another force called selective covariance. It was actually first defined by um, the, I believe it was Danish maybe, um, quantitative genetics geneticist Olaf Tadine in 1926 and uh, G. Ledyard Stebbins, who was here, of course, uh, at Davis at the end of his career. Um, G. Ledyard Stebbins, in his great book of 1950, Variation and Evolution in Higher Plants, um, cited Tedine's work and said, look, there's selective covariation, too. And what that is is basically you can have environmental conditions that select changes in two or more traits in correlated directions. I mean, 
classic example would be that when an organism moved, when its lineage somehow moves into the Arctic, it might be naturally selected to have, to have a larger body, relatively shorter limbs, and, and darker coloration. Um, and those are um, Berg, uh, Bergman's, Allen's, and Globler's rules. Um, and they don't mean, they'll create across a phylogeny where some lineages have become, uh, into, have gone into the Arctic and some haven't. They'll create across this phylogeny uh, a correlation between the changes of those traits, even though the traits may have no genetic covariation whatsoever. So this kind of, of selective covariance is, is highly important to keep in mind because it'll prevent you from naively equating covariance that you see across a phylogeny uh, with genetic covariation, and it, it causes some, uh, some difficulties of interpretation, but well to keep it in mind. Okay, the first project I'm going to talk about is with Fred Bookstein. Fred is, some of you who have encountered morphometric methods will know that Fred is the big guy in this field. He was for many years at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's retired from Michigan and he's part-time uh, on soft money at University of Washington, so I get to see him a lot. Uh, the rest of the time he's professor of anthropology at the University of Vienna, so he compute, commutes across the pole by, by plane. So Fred uh, and I have been talking about how do you use morphometric forms uh, analyzed by morphometric methods uh, along a phylogeny. And this will be in the context of a covarying Brownian motion model. Well, you can take the, um, the landmarks of the form. Let's say it's a two-dimensional form and it has um, x, y pairs and has p of them that are the coordinates of the landmarks going around the form. Um, can you just take those and put them onto a phylogeny and say, okay, those are going to be our, our quantitative characters. Uh, let's look at their covariation across the uh, phylogeny. And the, the real answer is no, you can't. And the reason you can't is that you have the problem that the way those coordinates were collected is someone takes a form, let's say it's nearly two-dimensional, let's say it's a flat fish, and they have a, a flat surface and they're going to lay it down on the surface and then they're going to collect uh, and digitize the locations of those, of those landmarks. Well, they take the, the flat fish and they toss it down and of course where it lands left to right on the, on the surface is a little bit, it, it's just a matter of how you threw it. Uh, it's not a feature of the organism. So its translation left to right and top and up and down is arbitrary and is really a property of the person making the measurements and not of the fish. Also, it'll have some rotation. When you throw it down, it won't always be in the same, at the same angle. Uh, and that rotation, again, is not a property of the fish. So we have to somehow superpose the specimens in such a way as to get rid of the translation and the rotation. Now, naively, the first thing you think is that we just have to come up with a superposition that puts them all into the same space and we can then see how close the landmarks in different specimens are to each other. And this, I want to argue, is dangerous. I want to argue there is no true superposition. And that's going to be a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. In fact, it was for me. When Fred and I started talking about this, I was busy explaining to him how contrast method and comparative methods work. Uh, and it wasn't it wonderful we could do this to this data. Uh, he was talking about morphometric spaces. And then we came to a disconnect where I said, well, we have to superpose. And he said, no, there isn't any superposition. Uh, you don't superimpose. You go instead into a morphometric space. And I raised my voice, and he raised his voice, and we, we got very irate at each other. Uh, he kept saying, no, there is none, there is none, there is none. And I just thought, this is impossible. I can't work with this guy. <laughs> uh, and then, after a little bit more thinking, it hit me that he was absolutely right. And I want to try to persuade you why he was absolutely right. Here is a, an imaginary fish that has 13 landmarks, which are the corners of this polygon. Uh, here's the same thing. And suppose we start from this ancestral form here. <laughs> and we evolve up two lineages. In first lineage, what happens is the front part of the fish stays superposed perfectly, 
but the back part moves backwards by one, that this point moves backwards by one centimeter, and that, so does that, so does that, so does that. They all move backwards by one centimeter. Well then, the true superposition is this one, and these forms are, the, the light gray and the black are to be, their best superposition is there. Uh, that looks perfectly straightforward. Let's go over here and watch what happens here. The front nine landmarks move forward by one centimeter, and the, the back four do not change. Okay? That's a different change, and now the true superposition is to perfectly superpose the back and not the front. Uh, and you can see that this is the correct superposition in this case. But are, in fact, these different results? The answer is going to be no, they're not. In fact, this form here and this form there are exactly the same form. Well, even though you might say in some sense that one, this is the correct superposition for this one and that's the correct superposition for that one, but there is no sense into which, in which the one can be preferred to the other. Um, they're exactly the same form. How do I know that they're exactly the same form? Well, aside from all the logic and the mathematics and the geometry, I know that when I drew this figure, I simply picked up this form, moved it over there, and put it down, uh, but in a slightly different place, and that's how I made it. So yes, they're the same form. I can guarantee you that. Um, so the, the result is then that in some sense there is no perfect way to superpose this form up here with this form down there. Uh, both of those and anything in between are perfectly uh, acceptable superpositions. And in fact, what we end up with is the view that what you want to work with when you're doing Brownian motion-y things, this, I'll skip over most of this, uh, is to say that what you want to do is take the specimens and consider not their absolute values of their coordinates, but the differences between them, and throw away the, the overall location and just work with the horizontal differences between them and the vertical differences between them. And that's a, a transform that you can make that's called a Helmert transform. I have it up here. It's, it's down there somewhere. And basically what it does is by, in, in effect, it's taking all the, one way would be to take, take all the horizontal positions, take the nose of the specimen and just measure um, how, let's see, from your point of view, the nose is over here, how far to the left, to the right of the nose each one is. There are p minus one of those numbers, and for vertical positions, take say the bottom, the bottom tip of the bottom fin, and measure how far above that every, everybody is. There are p minus one of those. So you've thrown away two coordinates, and now you're working with the differences between them. You don't have to do a superposition. Um, now that's fine. Uh, and there's various ways of doing it. You end up with 2p minus 2 coordinates, and you can think about using Brownian motion models. There are many ways, there are many of these different Helmert transforms. I can argue that it doesn't matter which one you use, any covariation that you infer can be translated into what you would get with the others. Um, it's, and you can use any arbitrary one you want. Um, I will be happy <coughs> to talk to people about that. However, rotation is a more serious issue. I'd like to have a, a counterpart to the Helmer transform for rotation that would just consider a specimen and throw it into some space where we got rid of the arbitrary rotation. Actually, I don't know any way to do that. Um, and that's annoying. I'd like to have something like a Helmer transform. You could, what we do is we either superpose the, the um, specimens. Well, here I am superposing. Um, by what's called a Procrustes fit, which is a least squares fit of form to each other, where that will take care of the rotations. Or there's a, a thing called the Bookstein transformation, uh, which is an approximate fit of the specimens to each other. Or the way I would like to do it is to say, before you go take these horizontal and vertical Helmert things, uh, rotate the specimens and try say keep the first specimen <coughs> fixed, just use it as a point of reference, and rotate the others with respect to it, and try all angles that you can, and then go through the rest of the analysis that you're going to do, which is to look at, at 
uh, Brownian motion models on a phylogeny, on a phylogeny that came from molecular data. <coughs> Uh, and you'll get out the other end a likelihood, or if you want to do it Bayesian, you'll get Bayesian posteriors. And we'll rotate <coughs> the specimens so as to maximize the likelihood. So we'll pick our rotation so as to make the final fit of everything that we're doing the best. Uh, so it's a technical issue, but uh, it's, this is the way that I, I would prefer to do that. And the, the result of all this is you've taken the 2P coordinates of the original specimen and reduce them by three. And you're now working in a 2p minus three-dimensional space. And from there on, you can just go do uh, covarying Brownian motion <coughs> methods. You can do, for example, contrast methods, other comparative methods, or any of the other stuff that we're going to talk about in the rest of the talk. Um, and you're in a space where, at least approximately, at least locally, you can think of them as changing by some kind of Brownian motion model allowing for different <coughs> rates at different <coughs> coordinates and allowing for covariation and estimating it. Okay. Uh, shape, let's see, I'll just say that we're working here, I would like to work not just with shape but with, with size as well, so I, we'll talk about these as forms, not shapes. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. And I want to give you an idea of, well, does, this, does anything like this work? Uh, what does it actually look like? So I invented an organism. I have to apologize, by the way. I know you're all biologists, or most of you. Um, I will not show any pictures of cute, fuzzy organisms, of uh, cute, fuzzy animals, or pretty plants. Uh, I won't even show you any analyses of real data. That's because you invited me. That's really the fundamental <coughs> problem. Uh, I will show you simulated data, which is much better because the thing that's great about simulated data is that you know the truth. Okay. <laughs> so here is our organism, which is the dreaded thresher salmon shark, Palaeoncorhynchus, which I invented. Um, and it's sort of a salmon-like thing with fins that stick up a lot. It happens to have 10 uh, landmarks going around. And there, there is the ancestral uh, dreaded thresher salmon shark. Here is a tree of. Um, 20 species, and we generated this tree, I sh for those who care, uh, by a pure birth process. So it's just lineages that split at random times uh, until you get 20 of them, and you're about to do the 21st one, and then you stop. I think we actually, in the, the simulation, did a 100, 100 species tree, something like this. So it's just a random tree with arbitrary uh, species at the tips, and they've changed by a Brownian motion scheme. Now, the Brownian motion that I did in the simulation was to say, we'll take each of these points and have it wander in a circular Brownian motion. So <coughs> it has a certain variance vertically, the same variance horizontally. Uh, it'll just be wandering from this starting point by a planar, ordinary Brownian motion. Except that these two points, the tops of the fins, are going to go up and down. This one will go up and down, wandering according to another Brownian motion. And that one will go up and down this line at a slightly greater uh, speed, but perfectly correlated. So the two fins are changing up, one going straight up and the other is going slightly backwards in a perfectly correlated way. Plus, each of these points has a, uh, a sort of smaller Brownian motion around it. Uh, well, what if we evolve um, a whole bunch of these thresher salmon sharks? and? Uh, we have the true superposition, actually. We know what it is. But it's, again, I wanted to emphasize that it's not something you can infer. You want to go into this 2p minus 3 uh, coordinate space. But it's easier to draw the pictures this way. And what we'll see is, yeah, the nose moves around. This one moves around. That one moves around. This one moves up and down more. That one moves up, down, more. Down here, smaller amounts of motion. Um, you, these are, I think, the first 20 of the 100 species. Um, and let's see. Here, if I do a Procrustes <coughs> least squares superposition, I get the front end points rather closer together than they really were. Uh, I get the fins moving rather more than they really were. But some of these back <coughs> points move too much. And that's because the, the least squares fit is trying too hard, in a sense, to fit the tips of the, of the uh, fins. 
the tips of the pins are actually moving a lot. So it should allow them more latitude, but it doesn't know that. The least squares machinery is trying too hard to get the pins on top of each other. And the result is it pushes these landmarks further apart than they should be. Um, I cannot show you a, what the um, forms would look like with the optimizing the thetas method that I just advocated a moment ago because I don't have that fully working in the computer. Uh, so I'll just use this. Uh, when you take the resulting coordinates, you go to the, you do the Helmert transform, you use, in this case, it's a Procrustes fit to get the angles right, approximately right, and then you take the resulting 17 dimensions and you go and do Brownian motion, uh, fit a Brownian motion model and infer covariance, what do you find? Well, what you find is the, the biggest component of variation, the first principal component, is what? Well, it has small loadings on all of these points and big loadings on these two that are just about right. It is getting correct the fact that the fin is going, this fin is going up and this fin is going back and those are perfectly correlated with each other. That's good. What's not so good is it's a su it is also inferring a small amount of motion, in fact rather too much motion here uh, for some of the back coordinates. Um, and it is inferring some noise, uh, some motion in the other coordinates. So if you were looking at the changes of these thresher salmon sharks across a phylogeny, this would capture approximately, looking across that phylogeny, that a large amount of the change had represented the, the growth of these two fins, that, that that really is a major event in the evolution across this phylogeny. Well, okay, now let's go to the second uh, project, and that is, okay, what do we do about fossils? Let's assume, yeah, we can do morphologic, we can do morphometric methods, we can do morphometric characters. We can do non-morphometric characters, ordinary measurements of various sorts. Uh, what do we do about fossils? And here the, um, the problem is that we have present-day species for which we have molecular information, and we've made a tree for them. And we're going to assume for the moment that the tree is perfect, that the tree is 100% is known. And then we've measured quantitative characters. We might have done morphometrics depends on what characters we're doing across the present, in the present day specimens, but we also have some fossils. And I'm going to assume the rather idealized case that the fossils are, we can collect all the same characters in the fossils. I'm not going to allow for the rather realistic case that fossils often are damaged or parts of them are missing. Um, I'm going to say, well, suppose we have exactly the same characters that we can get in the fossils, but we have no molecular data in those fossils. We have a phylogeny for the present day species and we consider that known, but the fossils, we know what time they're at, but we don't know exactly where they hook in to the phylogeny. So the, the problem will be, how can we figure out where the fossils hook into the phylogeny? And for that, um, let's see, there is an existing set of methods uh, that people are now using. And what they do is they take the fossil and they find features on the fossil and in the present day species uh, with states that can be interpreted as derived states or uh, synapomorphies <coughs> if you prefer. And then they look at the fossil and say, well, uh, these three species here have a synapomorphy. They share a derived state which probably arose somewhere on this lineage. This species here also has that derived state. So we're going to infer from that that it must have connected into this branch uh, or one of the others up here, I should say, um, and not down here because then it would have had to acquire the synapomorphy separately and sort of in a parsimony framework, uh, you, you consider that a bad thing. Um, and so even though we know that this fossil is not the ancestral species, and we know it must have hooked into that lineage somewhere below there, uh, we don't know how far. Uh, let's hook it in here. And people have started putting, um, using Bayesian methods and putting priors on how far down you have to go, how, how old that lineage was before it uh, came out of this 
lineage that you got from the present day species. So there's a kind of machinery out there that people are using, using synapomorphies to try to figure out which branches fossils connect to, and then using uh, various kinds of prior distributions to try to figure out how long they evolved on their own after coming off of that branch before you got to see the fossil. Uh, those are interesting methods, but there is another method that Frederick Ronquist of the Natural History Museum in, in Stockholm is developing, and I've been developing it too. Fred and I uh, both came up with approaches of the same generic <laughs> sort independently, uh, and we're getting ready to publish together in uh, systematic biology if we can either of us get the paper written, get, get the two papers written. Fred is using uh, statistical models, he's using a complete Bayesian framework with statistical <coughs> models of zero, one characters or, mul or multi-state characters, but discrete characters, not morphological measurements. I'm using Brownian motion models, but the logic is really the same. And the logic goes, in, at least in the version that I like to talk about, goes something like this. Uh, we have um, our fossil morphology, we have our present day morphology, we have our molecular sequences. We can infer a tree, once again I'll take it as completely known, which is idealized and there are ways around that. But we have these morphological characters and we can say, well, for the ones on the present day species, we can infer on this tree as a comparative method study um, we can infer what their covariation of their changes was. We can infer things about the, their process. So I'm going to sort of picture at that this way. There's some set of covariances among the characters as they evolve up the tree. We can make an inference of that. Um, now, if we do that, we can say, well, now we know something about the, morph the way the morphology evolves. Let's apply that to the fossils. And let's then say, come up with placements of the fossils on the tree uh, using those covariances that we estimated from the present day species and our fossil morphology. So we want to put all of this information together, sort of in this case taking the tree as, as fixed, uh, as known from the molecular sequences, and try out different placements for the fossils and see how well they fit into the statistical model the Brownian motion statistical model. And a little cartoon of it would look something like this. We'd have present day species, a tree, uh, fossils, uh, let's say these two come together, I'm um, being a little simple minded. We could say imagine hooking them there, that, there, then we can imagine evaluating the likelihood for the whole set of data, the whole set of, of quantitative character data uh, on, the on that tree and seeing what number we got out, and there it is over here. And then we can try moving the connection down the tree, and as we do so, the likelihood changes, and we can imagine uh, tracing out a, a curve, and then of course it would tell us that this connection here is a, much, is a better connection than that one, uh, that somewhere up in here is the best place to connect those two species. This is just a cartoon. Um, but can we, make, can we make that real? Well, I'm going to have lots of equations, but I'm not really going to talk about them. Uh, they're just here so I can wave my hands up and say, and say that it can be shown. Um, it can be shown that if you take a tree, a known tree, uh, you take some covariances that you're estimating, um, and you um, evaluate the log likelihood and then you go cranking away and you try um, to you reduce, let's see, you take contrasts <coughs> of the tips of the tree, but I will not, I, I'm going to skip over what we're really doing there. Um, it turns out that after you have put the fossils in in some particular place and you're cranking through the likelihood and you're trying to estimate from this the covariances between the characters. You can work out uh, what the estimate should be. And what you end up with is an interesting little formula. And what it says is, for this particular placement of the fossils, the log likelihood is some constant, uh, minus n minus 1 over 2, where n is the number of species, times the log of the determinant of your estimated covariance matrix. For those who are into uh, contrast methods, 
in comparative methods, it is just says, hook the fossils in at some particular place, take that tree, make the contrasts, get the independent contrasts out, make your inference of the covariances, of, and then it will turn out that the log likelihood of that for that placement is just proportional, negatively proportional to the log of the determinant of your estimated covariances. In other words, if you want to find the best placement, find the best the placement that minimizes the determinant of the co of the estimated covariances among the characters, which is kind of a uh, acute result, uh, but not a not a particularly difficult result to get mathematically. So this is just saying that you hook up the fossil somewhere, obtain the contrast for the tree, and then you you minimize the determinant of uh, the resulting estimated covariances. So we take the fossil, one fossil and we go into the tree and hook it in in all possible places, evaluate the contrast for each, evaluate the, the um, estimate the covariances for each, find the determinant of the uh, covariance matrix, uh, and we try all possible placements till we find the one that minimizes that. If we have multiple fossils, you can do it iter iteratively. You can add them on one at a time each time in the best place, and then we consider some of them, pulling them off and re-adding them in each place, and keep doing that for a lot of times until finally you find the best joint set of placements um, that maximizes that likelihood, minimizes the determinant of the covariance matrix. And um, we aren't guaranteed that that algorithm will find the best placement, but I think that in practice it's going to do fine. Um, so there is a way to figure out the hooking up of the fossils, but I have pulled the fast one on you. I have assumed something that isn't really true. I mean, aside from the fact that all these models are, are idealized. And that is, um, well, let me, let me get, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I was first <coughs> going to show you it operating. Then I was going to tell you that I pulled something fast on you. But let's, let me show you this first. Here is a case where I simulated a tree, a random branching tree, including a species F that was really up here. I then took that tree, shrank F back down, and made it a fossil. Okay. So this is the tree including nine present-day species and one fossil. I then um, evolved eight um, independent, they were actually independent, equally varying um, Brownian motion characters. So there was covariation among them, except that really what it, I, the truth is it was zero, but I didn't tell the method that. Um, I then used this method, and I tried to hook up F in all kinds of places. And I, I didn't allow F to hook up anywhere later than the time we found it. So I tried all the places from this point in the tree on down. And all I've done here is show you the, the numerical results, which are that if you want to be within one unit of log likelihood, um, those are the green areas, all those placements. And this is the one that has the highest likelihood. It's on this branch. It's branches, the F branch is right off of here. Um, it actually branched right off there. Okay. The, we're using traffic light colors. One unit of log likelihood is green. Two units of log likelihood is orange. Three, two or more is red. And so you can get the sense. You get the sense that what is this method doing? It's placing it somewhere in this region of the tree. It's not getting it quite right, uh, but it isn't doing horribly. It's, it's for that one fossil, it's sort of putting it in the right area of the tree. Now, um, at this point, I say, but I pulled the fast one on you. And what the fast one that I pulled on you is to say, I assumed that the tree you inferred from the other nine species, which was our molecular tree, was on a scale that you could interpret as time. But anybody who's done molecular trees knows that you come up with a tree that's got branch lengths, but it doesn't have time. It has branches that might be 0.02 long, but the question is 0.02 units of what? Well, that's 0.02 units of change per site in DNA, but you'd have to, to make that into time, you'd have to have some kind of calibration of DNA change with time. And I want to now allow for the case where we get a tree out 
from the molecular study that has branch lengths, we are going to assume, and this is a strong assumption, that the tips are uh, all level with each other, that's a clock-like tree. You may say, wait a second, you shouldn't assume a clock. Things get very rough if I don't assume a clock, so I'm assuming a clock. And now what I want to do is to say, well, we don't know how to scale this molecular tree into time, so let's try different scalings. And here, is, here are the fossils whose times we do know. We know how many million years ago they were. Um, and here I have them both hooked up in somewhat different places. And what I'm going to do is try different stretchings of the molecular tree, different scalings of branch length with time, and make that another parameter and estimate it. So what we're going to do is take the molecular tree, stretch it out, draw it on a rubber sheet, stretch it out various by various amounts. For each of those, we're going to do our whole fossil placement machinery. And we're going to accept the stretching that, together with the fossils, yields the highest likelihood. So what we're doing here is not only to estimate the fossil placements, but to, to use the fossils to do the time scale um, calibration for the molecular tree, which is something that, well, you might have some other data that, that you could think of using for that, but um, at least for this limited set of data, that's what's available, is to use the actual fossils. And you might have to have quite a few fossils to get a very accurate um, scaling of the molecular tree. So that's an additional thing to worry about. Um, and let's see. Uh, if we scale, I'm not actually sure what this means. So I'm going to <laughs> skip over. But I did some examples of that. Third example. Well, we're, we're, we're running on in time. Um, but we started at 410, so I guess it's not as bad as I think. Um, the, third, the third case that I'm going to cover is um, what do you do about characters that are morphological characters, but they're not continuous characters? So it isn't immediately obvious how to apply Brownian motion to them. Um, there, uh, let's take a character that's a 0, 1 character. We might have a uh, a reptile, we might have a scale on the reptile, and there might be a ridge on the scale of the, of the, on the scale, or not. The scale might be smoother, it might have a ridge on it. So there'd be some sort of all or none character that we can measure on it. How can we think of a model in which we can use similar machinery to deal with zero, one characters? And there, um, there are some methods that people are using. Um, Mark Pagel, uh, in 1994, now at the University of Reading in England, um, Mark Pagel had a model where he just said, well, we want us to do uh, comparative method studies on zero, one characters. So let's sort of pretend that they're nucleotides. Let's pretend only there's only two nucleo possible nucleotides. And you can mutate back and forth between them. You can substitute one for the other. So let's make this simple two-state Markov process uh, and do likelihoods on the tree. And he has a whole machinery for looking at the covariation of two characters like this as they come down a tree. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of it. It's a, it's a, cute, it's a cute paper. Um, and that was in 1994. More recently, Paul Lewis at University of Connecticut um, considered similar models, like two-state models like this, also k-state models where you change symmetrically among K different states. And he also, um, he didn't consider covariation between them. He assumed that they're changing independently. And his uh, project was to infer the tree itself, assuming that the characters change independently. So there is a machinery out there. And the way that the common thing that's assumed in that machinery is that zeros that you can have discrete states and you pop back and forth stochastically between those states. Okay. Well, what I want to do is present a slightly different model that I think has some biological advantages over um, this Markov chain model of zero, one characters. And that's a model called the threshold model. And it was invented by this guy. Uh, and as people who are familiar with evolutionary biology will know, or with animal breeding for that matter, uh, this is Sewell Wright, who is one of the three great founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis and of theoretical population genetics and thereby 
one of the three great founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis. He lived a tremendously long life. He died in his 99th year with a paper in press. Um, here he is shown <laughs> on the occasion of, it was the year he um, retired from the University of Chicago, moved to the University of Wisconsin. Um, he uh, was also admitted that year to the National Academy of Sciences. I think this is his National Academy of Science uh, formal portrait. He wrote some of his diffusion equations for uh, <coughs> theoretic for uh, gene frequencies from his great, great 1931 paper on the board. And he had his organism that he worked on for years. He did almost all the quantitative genetics that's ever been done on guinea pigs. He worked for quite a few years as a chief animal husbandman at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And in 1925, he came to the University of Chicago and was there for 30 years. So he did all the, all the genetics on guinea pigs that, that anybody has ever done. And he had a lot of insight into uh, quantitative characters in lines of guinea pigs. Um, there is a persistent rumor that right after this photograph that he turned around and absentmindedly <laughs> he raced the board with the guinea pig. He furiously denied this. Um, but there were other people who had taken courses from Wright who said they'd seen him do that because he used to bring guinea pigs to his lecture and say, look at this one, look at the colors on this one, look at the colors on that one. And when he worked on the blackboard, he was a terrible lecturer, a terrible teacher. Um, he, um, he would be up at the board mumbling furiously and writing equations, and he would take the erasers and put an eraser under his arm to hold it near him so he could quickly erase things. Um, and he would be mumbling away there. I'm, you don't know how often his suits had to be cleaned. Um, and one day, a guinea pig was wandering around too much, so he did what anybody, I, I've worked as a lab tech with animals, and I know, that with rabbits and guinea pigs, you can calm them down by taking them, putting them under your armpit and covering both eyes. And they then are so dumb that they think they're in a hole and they calm down. So he obviously picked up the guinea pig and put it under his arm and continued writing equations on the board and the inevitable happened. <laughs> so uh, people swore that they saw that. Oh, okay, what model did he make? He made this model. He said he had some lines of guinea pigs he was crossing and he had different frequencies of the hind, t hind, the hind <coughs> foot having three toes or four toes. He actually didn't just have those two states. He had another state called poor four toe, but I'm going to kind of ignore <laughs> that. And he said, let's imagine an underlying scale, which has come to be called liability, that we cannot observe. It's a quantitative character determined by multiple genes. There is a threshold on this underlying trait in development such that if your phenotype is to the right of that point, you get four toes. And if the phenotype is to the left, you get three toes. So it's a developmental threshold on an unmeasurable trait, but one that you imagine is there, and one which, if you could see it, you could do quantitative genetics on it. And he was then able to use this model to predict frequencies of four, three, and four toeedness in different crosses of different lines and show that it roughly worked. Well, suppose we want to use this threshold model, which is, it's come to be used in um, some human genetics. Uh, it's also still widely used in um, animal breeding. One of the great um, uses of it was in poultry breeding uh, by, um, Michael Lerner, who was at University of California, Berkeley, uh, for many years. So it's, it's a model in use in quantitative genetics. In fact, there are people like Daniel Gianola, who, are, who he and his students are doing very elaborate Markov chain Monte Carlo things on pedigrees using the threshold model uh, in quantitative genetics. It's in active, it's in active use in, among animal breeders. Um, what I'm going to do is imagine it working on a phylogeny. And what we're going to do is imagine that you have such a threshold, which will place it zero just because, well, we can't observe the scale anyway. We might as well assume that the zero point is the, uh, is the threshold. The population will be distributed in some sort of normal distribution with a mean, and that will imply a certain frequency of three-toedness or four-toedness, or whatever our two states are. We can imagine the mean of this distribution wandering by Brownian motion and a lineage. And over here, I have an example, a simulation, 
where you start out with the mean sitting exactly on the threshold, and then you go up this phylogeny um, having a, a Brownian motion of the mean. And at each point, you can calculate what fraction of the distribution is the black state instead of the white state. And you can see that I filled in here what fraction of the population is black. And here at the nodes here, I've, I've said how many standard deviations up or down the mean of the population is from the threshold. And in this lineage, you go jet down a little bit and then back up. Uh, everybody gets to be a black state. Um, and here the, the mean is up at 5.3. Here the mean has wandered down a little bit. It's not down near zero, but you can see there's a small percentage of what the white state, then it goes back up. Here it goes down, comes back a little bit, goes down, then in this lineage comes back up. Okay, so you're, you're watching a threshold model evolving up an imaginary phylogeny and seeing the frequencies of the two states. One of the advantages of the threshold model is that it, it doesn't just say that the whole species is in state zero or one, but it predicts proportions of individuals, of phenotypes in the population, which is an advantage, a great advantage over the Markov chain model. It also has the advantage that once you wander past zero, you might come back, but if you wait long enough, you're likely to have wandered far enough away that you're less likely to come back. So a change back to state zero is is likely soon after it changes to state one, but less likely later on, and that strikes me as biologically reasonable. Okay, what can you do if you want to compute likelihoods with this, car with this machinery? Well, I'm not going to go into the details, except to say that what you have to do is to get the probability of, say, um, let's just think of a single observation from each species of 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 at the tips of the tree for one character. You have to integrate some normal distributions implied by the Brownian motion along that have, have distributions that are implied by the tree. And you have to integrate a corner of the distribution and say, well, the one, if there's two, two tips, the 1, 0 possibility is the volume under this corner, this um, section here of the, of a correlated, a co-varying normal distribution. Well, that's hard. There are no <coughs> simple analytical formulas for it. Um, this is saying basically the same thing. But what you can do is you can develop Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery for it. You can take the unknown liabilities and wander them around on their scales. And if you do it in an informed way by Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery, uh, you can sample from the, the distribution that would be implied for them by what you know about the tips. And what I'm just showing here is you can take a, you can set up some imaginary liabilities for the tips up here and the interior nodes of the tree. You can take one of them and reconsider it by sampling um, and come up with a new value, say it's this one. Um, I want to show you a simulation, oh and for the tips up the top, you reconsider their value, but always require that they stay on the proper side of the threshold so that they have the proper state. Uh, if you do that, here's a computer, a simple computer simulation of this. Uh, I have tips that are 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, these guys are placed sort of arbitrarily, but we then start our Markov chain machinery. We reconsider the placement of some of those interior nodes and the tips. And we sample from what the viability, what the liabilities, I'm sorry, might have been. So um, with Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery, you can do that. My objective is that if you do this on multiple characters, can you do it in a way such that you end up estimating the covariation of the traits along the phylogeny? Um, here's a, a simple simulation. I've got that machinery working. Uh, here is a hundred tip tree. It's, you know, I simulated a tree by a pure birth process. Then I evolved a threshold model, three three characters in a threshold model up it. I made them correlated characters. Here, here are the resulting zero one <coughs> phenotypes that I got. They sort of look okay. You can see 
that there are groupings on the tree, like this one, clades, that have rather similar phenotypes. I, I actually assumed some covariation between these characters. I had the, they had different variances. Uh, I had some positive covariation between numbers one and two, negative covariation between numbers two and three, and zero covariance between one and three. I just use that as a, um, an example. And when I do that, and I generate data sets on the known tree, I assume the tree is known, I generate the zero, one characters, I infer the variances and covariances of the characters. Here are the correlations I get between the characters. So in a hundred replicates, that's evolving a hundred different <coughs> sets of phenotypes. And taking each one and estimating the, the correlation between characters one and two, the true correlation, I just showed you the covariances a moment ago, if you calculate the correlation, here is the true, covari the true correlation. Here are the inferences we made running 100 different MCMC runs. Here it is for one and three, they have a correlation of zero. Their inferred correlations spread out from almost minus one to almost plus one very widely, but they're centered about right. Here, 0.5145, or my, sorry, that should be minus 0.5145. Uh, and here, the, here are the values we infer. So the first thing you can say is, well, it's getting the covariation approximately correct. We've got the true tree, so we're assuming molecular data delivered that somehow. And now we've taken these zero, one morphological characters, and we've made a roughly correct estimate of the covariation among them, among their unknown liabilities, as they evolve, as illuminated by the zero one characters. Um, you can extend this to deal with the uncertainty in the tree itself by using, instead of one tree, using a whole <coughs> sample, a bootstrap sample of trees or a Bayesian posterior of trees. Uh, there are ways you can deal with within species variation using machinery that um, has already been is already out there. Uh, I have not, in all of these uh, pieces that I've talked about, talked about a competitor to Brownian motion, the ornstein uhlenbeck model, which is Brownian motion where you're being where natural selection is pulling you in towards uh, some optimum. Uh, but that can be put into that all of these sorts of things can be done with that too. But a more important point that's, that I make sure I mention is this threshold machinery for zero one characters can also unify comparative methods with both discrete and continuous characters in a very simple way. I was, I was doing all this and I had the program working uh, and then it suddenly hit me. What would I do if one of these characters was not really discrete but was continuous? And I said, well, in that case, We'd know it's at the tip, we would know what its value was. We'd know what the population mean was. And then I said, well, then that's the only thing that would be different about it, is that we would know the tip value. So maybe we can analyze continuous characters and discrete characters all in the same framework by this MCMC machinery by simply saying that for the ones that are continuous, we just treat the tip value as known and nail it down and don't change it. And for the others, we allow the Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery to move them around. So it gives you very nicely both a somewhat realistic model, a mo I think more realistic than these Markov chain models, for zero, one type characters. It gives you a unified way of analyzing um, continuous and discrete characters on known trees. Um, and it, but there's a couple of um, warnings that I have to give. Oh, I have to say that in the future, all of this, all of these kinds of data are also going to get involved with work on QTLs. Now, we're not there yet. We're very far from it. Uh, but people will be trying to infer quantitative trait loci within individual species by genetic experimentation. And people will be wanting to hook that to these comparative method type machinery for discrete and continuous morphological characters. Um, and it's going to be 
a way of using phylogenetic cross-species information to further illuminate the evolution of QTLs. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail except to say I think there is some hope that co-varying characters that, we, that, that looking at, their, at how their QTLs change, we could get some sense of when there are two characters co-varying uh, and they're genetically co-varying, which one is the one that's under natural selection. Uh, but there's some, some warnings I have to give, and I think these warnings are very serious and fairly general. One is that with any sample of species, and we have 50, suppose we take 50 species of lizard, um, and we want to do the analysis. We have to keep in mind that that's just the sample of 50. Um, and there will be limited power to infer the covariation of traits along phylogenies. And I showed you that. I showed you that in the 0, 1 threshold case, we had 100 tips, and yet we got these very noisy estimates of correlation. Now, there is no way of using the, the Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery and making it much more intensive and much more elaborate and making those estimates very precise. That noise is built into the problem. It's the noise of the randomness of the evolution in the first place. No amount of analyzing the data afterwards is going to give us much more precise estimates of those correlations. Um, so we have to find ways to propagate that uncertainty through the analysis take it into account, take it to heart, report it, carry it on to any further studies that we do to try to understand the uh, evolution of those characters and just say, look, well, we have these rough estimates of covariation and they've got big plus or minuses on them. Let us, in drawing our further biological conclusions, take those big plus and minuses into account. We are never going to have a fly-on-the-wall account of evolution in spite of what the journals Nature and Science would like to think. If you want to get a paper into Nature or Science, do an analysis of genetic data and tell them that you can infer that um, this mutation occurred 7,398 years ago on a Thursday morning at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, and they'll love it. They'll eat it up. They'll print it. Scientists discover mutation occurred 7,398 years ago. That's information you could only get if you were a fly on the wall watching evolution <coughs> happen and say, aha, it just mutated. Um, but real life inferences aren't going to give us that. Even in those inferences, there are huge plus or minuses which somehow never get into the press release. Um, so. I, I do want to say we're not going to have a fly on the wall. We're not going to have an account of everything that ever happened in evolution, no matter how much of this machinery we throw at things. And we're just going to have to learn to live with that and learn to propagate that our uncertainty uh, through uh, our analyses. But furthermore, we're using here very idealized models such as Brownian motion. Uh, obviously, those aren't really correct. Uh, when people try to make the estimates more precise, they they say, well, let's go to a much larger number of species. But as you go out to much larger numbers of species, you expand the tree to related groups, um, you will come to, to morphologies uh, and kinds of species that will not fit your model. And so the models, as you go to broader and broader groups, the models get creakier and creakier and less and less accurate. And we're just going to have to keep that in mind and be a little bit humble about that. So I'll just finish by saying that um, this is an example of a great movement that I think is occurring in um, evolutionary biology now. Um, for the last four or five decades, mo molecular population genetics has gone on. Population genetics has achieved interesting things. Molecular evolution of species of Molecular evolution across different species has achieved things, but in almost in isolation from each other. The people working on molecular evolution knew very little about population genetics and vice versa. And that's a kind of distressing situation. Yes, there were some connections. Moto Kimura made one. Um, but mostly we had these two kinds of people doing these two kinds of different analyses. Now, there's a new movement of these two lines of work back towards each other. It's not the result of any one person's work. 
uh, but it's, a, it's the result of work on things like coalescence, uh, trees of genes, which you can extend across species. You can see uh, gene trees in multiple species and, and look at things like effective population size and inferences about ancestral species. There also are uh, the DSDN, the uh, 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 non, um, the, the non-synonymous synonymous ratios inferences that are going on between species, certainly connected <coughs> to within species population genetics. So there's some real connections now. And I think that the kind of models that I've shown you, as abstract as they are, um, are another way of trying to connect together using the machinery of this, now this time the machinery of, quantita of classical quantitative genetics uh, to connect these kinds of two lines of work. And I think it is, as that happened, we will be able to make uh, Russ's vision of uh, a use of quantitative genetics across multiple species a reality. I'll just end with the references. These are to other people, which I will um, I'll flip away from those very quickly. Uh, these are some papers where I said various parts of what I've said today, uh, and I will leave them. I will leave you staring at that, and be happy to take questions. Thanks. Better let some of you escape. So, an underlying assumption is that the variance covariance matrix is constant. Yes. And yet, the more those covariances are being driven by selection, the more I would think that's a pretty sketchy assumption. It, it seems sketchy it even it's a purely genetic variance covariance. Yeah, even the, the purely genetic covariance, which is, remember that the covariances we see in change of lineages are a consequence of the genetic covariances and the selective covariances, both. Um, that's really an extension, by the way, of the old breeder's equation where it's the heritability times the selection differential. You can make a multivariate version of that, and, and it basically shows that. Yes, that is a dicey assumption. I've heard people complain about it a lot. They say, oh, we just did a lot of quantitative genetics and we've discovered something terribly exciting. The covariance matrices in different species are different. And I say, well, you know, you kind of would assume that that will sometimes occur. And uh, So yeah, that's a nice conclusion. And they say, and we need to be given another $5 million so we can study another bunch of species and show that the covariance matrices are different. Um, and I, <laughs> after a while, I say, well, OK, they're different. but." You know, uh, we know that. Here we're assuming they're the same. If somebody says, you have to take into account in this model that the covariance matrices are different, I will say, I'd love to. Give me a tractable mathematical model of the change in the covariance right. matrices. I'll use it in a flash. But I will listen too hard to people raising the, the, object, the objection of realism. Um, uh, you know. Uh, critics will be admitted to the event, but they must come carrying a tractable <laughs> model, alternative <laughs> model. I think that's too harsh a, a, a response to you, but uh, anyway, that's a comment. Brad. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the book scheme, the first part of the, of yeah. the talk, um, <clears throat> so I mean, it seems to me the, the, the place where you'd like to go forward. Um, I mean, I was certainly Fred worked on nice flat fishes. He worked on piranhas because they were easy to work yeah. with and stuff. But what you really like to be able to do is take very three-dimensional, very complex CT scans, yeah. and you'd like to be able to do, if not infinite point, at least an awful lot of them in three, very much three dimensions, yeah. and grow those and, and look at those in the same way. Um, is that is that simply is that sort of an easy scalability issue? Is that a, a very complicated? When you get the data, um, in principle, could you can, can you expand it in that way? Uh, the interesting thing is, there for once, the answer is yes. I could have easily done, as easily done three D. 
the, the helmet transforms work perfectly. The rotations are now in two angles that you have to have, but you just do you, right. you do them so as to optimize things. Um, Fred has extensions um, to cases where instead of having landmarks, you have a curve where there are no landmarks, and you put what are called, I think, pseudo landmarks on yeah. those, and you sort of optimize their placement. How that will exactly work with this machinery, I'm, I don't understand it well enough yet, but I bet there's a way uh, to do that. So I suspect that 3D and uh, surfaces in 3D and so on are, are doable in this framework. Now, all of it is assuming Brownian motion, and that's, we'd like to actually have more realistic changes. That Brownian motion has some problems. It could, two landmarks could pass each other and get on the wrong side of each other. You'd like to have more sophisticated models that rule that out. So for the moment, it's a, it's a model of small amounts of change. But I think, it's, I think we're OK with, with 3D and with those issues. And, and does it also scale up to really be different things? I mean, in principle, could you do a whale and a mouse? I think in principle, yes, and in practice, no. Um, I think that you'd have a hard time finding landmarks um, there, I think that what's happened is things have gotten nonlinear enough between whales and mice that I'd be scared. Um, but I think you can find landmarks that are even true in a whale and a mouse, but very few people would give you money to do that. <laughs> but if you have like 50 species of mice, sure. Yeah. 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 So the, uh, in this last part of your presentation, you talked about this threshold. Yeah. How easy it is to, I mean, to account for variation of the threshold in time or across the universe? I think that I haven't thought about that, but I think that it might be the same as a move uh, as the uh, if. If the threshold stays the same and the population wanders, is that different from the threshold wandering and the population staying the same? Um, maybe I'm it's just the same model being described in a different way, or maybe not. I, I don't know. The short answer is I don't know. Well, I have a question for you. So I'm interested in not so much the Brownian motion assumption as the choosing the landmarks in the first place. So if, if I have what the real landmark that is evolving under Brownian motion, say, is at one position. And the point that I've chosen as the landmark is you know, tracking that position, but in some nonlinear way, you know, as this yeah. curve moves. Then, then that point that will be tracking the landmark won't be under Brownian motion. Is there any way you could extend the approach to identify which landmarks would be sensible? I think that the answer will be that if you had a, a, if you had landmarks that were defined by, say, being halfway in between two points, yes, they don't do Brownian motion, but if you do small amounts of change, small amounts of Brownian motion, they more or less do. So I think as long as you're restricted to modest amounts of change, it won't be a big problem if you define some points that way. Uh, my guess is that, that we can live with that, but the of course, we're already having trouble with issues of, you know, as, land, as things forms get very, very different, uh, you want to not allow certain kinds of mo movement that a Brownian motion model would allow. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for people to look at forms and come up with other kinds of uh, constraints on Brownian motion or other spaces to go into where you could do Brownian motion in that space and then it would keep your forms OK in this space. I think there's a lot to be done there, um, inspired by knowing more about the shape and what its constraints need to be. But I think as long as you have small amounts of change, uh, this, is, this is not something I think will, will cause too much trouble. Yeah. So you are talking some about um, sort of optimizing your rotation instead of yeah. merely using some sort of transformation. Um, well, I'd like to be able to just have a magic transformation like this Helmer thing that gets rid of, <coughs> drops you down one parameter and gets rid of rotation, but nobody's ever come up with one. And so it seems like your solution is more of um, exploring it almost in a um, sort of, I don't know, 
um, exploring a lot of different options and trying to find the best. Are you going to run into computational issues if you're getting into the three-dimensional near-infinite yeah. right things? Yeah, you are. There's not any shortcuts uh, in that? I, there, I think there are some ways that will actually uh, help in that you can take you know, the rest of the tree and there are these pruning algorithms for, for uh, getting contrasts <coughs> and updating things and getting down to a node near the one you're rotating. And then I think you can find the rotate, try the rotations and find the best one for that one, given everything else, relatively quickly. Um, I didn't talk about that. And I think that might help. But yeah, as you get to larger numbers of landmarks in three dimensions, and you have two, two degrees of freedom for each um, form, uh, you, you simply become grateful that we don't have four dimensions. Although I guess you know, with development, we do have four dimensions. But, uh, Let's take one more question. So what about these two models of evolutionary change that you mentioned, Brownian motion and OU? Do you think we're ever going to move to something more complex, or do you think there's not enough data biology in the framework? Well, people are doing that. There's a lot of activity right now for people looking at uh, what happens. In the ornstein Nolenbeck model is very much a model of climbing an adaptive peak. You're being pulled towards the peak, and you're wandering away from it all the time. Um, then people say, well, what about what if as you go through the phylogeny, at a certain point, the, the optimum is changed? And people are fitting models like that, uh, models of ornstein Nullenbeck with two different attraction points in different parts of phylogeny, <coughs> trying to do tests and so on. I think Carl is, probably knows more about this than I do, but I think that what you will find is, yes, you can test those kinds of models, but if you thought this was noisy, that gets even more noisy. And you're going to run out of steam long before you get to very elaborate models with many, many different adaptive peaks. Uh, and you're not going to have the degrees of freedom to infer um, those. You might be helped by, do, by experimental evolution studies within each species testing um, what selection is by using within species inference of selection. Um, there'll be some gain from that. But we are probably our imagination can outrun our ability to tell the difference between these models. Let's thank Joe once again. And furthermore, they're going to co-vary with each other in, in a way that you have to infer. Um, you don't know in advance. There'll be some kind of, of correlations among their uh, Brownian motion. So it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of colored Brownian motion. It's co-varying Brownian motion. And that will be the, the sort of central model uh, that people uh, are using. Uh, the use of Brownian motion models for quantitative characters started out um, with the case of gene frequencies in the 1960 by Anthony Edwards and Luca Cavalli Sforza, who wrote a tremendously pioneering papers on the inference of phylogenies. They introduced the first parsimony method. They introduced the first likelihood method. Um, and they almost introduced the first distance matrix method, but they waited three years to publish that. And Walter Fitch had slightly scooped them by the time that they, uh, that they did. But in their work, they approximated the change of gene frequencies through time. It, uh, these are gene frequencies in human populations by approximating it by Brownian motion, which it isn't exactly because gene frequencies are on a scale of 0 to 1, whereas Brownian motion is on an infinite sc a scale that's infinite in all directions. Um, I later expanded the model to uh, model quantitative characters determined by those genes. Uh, that's not very much of a jump. Um, and but the person who really made 
um, the mod used the Brownian motion model most effectively uh, was this guy, Russ Landy, uh, who was recently at University of California, San Diego, but now he's at Imperial College uh, in Britain. And Russ, in the 1980s, wrote a series of very pioneering papers uh, in the late se sorry in the late 70s on into the early 80s, um, in which he took quantitative genetics of the field of the, the uh, genetics of quantitatively measurable characters important in animal and plant breeding. Um, and he said, let's apply it to natural populations. And let's make some methods that will be usable for analyzing natural population quantitative characters. And he used as his central uh, rather daring approximation is something that, that when you think about it is a little scary. He said, let's assume that the quantitative genetic model for a bunch of characters holds for millions of years, and that we can analyze uh, chain, long term changes in lineages or divergence of lineages uh, and put this in a quantitative genetic framework. And it was actually a very daring thing to do. And his models of how much variation would be maintained long term in quantitative characters by balances between mutation and optimizing some methods. We'll know that Fred is the big guy in this field. He was for many years at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's retired from Michigan, and he's part-time uh, on soft money at University of Washington, so I get to see him a lot. Uh, the rest of the time, he's professor of anthropology at the University of Vienna, so he compute, commutes across the pole by, by plane. So Fred uh, and I have been talking about how do you use morphometric forms uh, analyzed by morphometric methods uh, along a phylogeny. And this will be in the context of a covariating Brownian motion model. Well, you can take the, um, the landmarks of the form. Let's say it's a two-dimensional form, and it has um, x, y pairs, and has p of them, that are the coordinates of the landmarks going around the form. Um, can you just take those and put them onto a phylogeny and say, okay, those are going to be our, our quantitative characters. Uh, let's look at their covariation across the uh, phylogeny. And the, the real answer is no, you can't. And the reason you can't is that you have the problem that the way those coordinates were collected is someone takes a form, let's say it's nearly two-dimensional, let's say it's a flatfish and they have a, a flat surface and they're going to lay it down on the surface and then they're going to collect uh, and digitize the locations of those, of those landmarks. Well, they take the, the flatfish and they toss it down and of course where it lands left to right on the, on the surface is a little bit, it, it's just a matter of how you threw it. Uh, it's not a feature of the organism. So its translation left to right and top and up and down is arbitrary and is really a property of the person making the measurements and not of the fish. Also, it'll have some rotation. When you throw it down, it won't always be in the same, at the same angle. Uh, and that rotation, again, is not a property of the fish. So we have to somehow superpose the specimens in such a way as to get rid of the translation and the rotation. Now, naively, the first thing you think is that we just have to come up with a superposition that puts them all into the same space and we can then see how close the landmarks in different specimens are to each other. And this, I want to argue, is dangerous. I want to argue there is no true superposition. And that's going to be a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. In fact, it was for me. When Fred and I started talking about this, I was busy explaining to him how contrast method and comparative I, I guess I should give a brief introduction. Uh, so it's a great honor, really, to have Joe Feldstein come here. He was one of the first names I encountered when I came to this campus as a, a new graduate student, written there above the teacups, Feldstein Zone. It, it took six months before I learned that had anything to do with Long Branch attraction. Uh, it wasn't just the name of our little cafe there. Uh, I had the honor to meet Joe Feldstein at Evolution last year. And uh, the fortune to, to give a talk right before his and watch all of these people come in to see my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this is called the Felsenstein effect at the evolution meetings. So 
doing my orals, I was describing a likelihood calculation when we sort of move up the tree, and one of my committee members reminded me, you remember this is called the, the Joe Felsenstein printing algorithm. Joe, Joe, we wanted to first to remind you that uh, the computer scientist called a peeling algorithm 10 years before, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so I should have known that Felsenstein would have such a central role in my career as I was born in the year of Felsenstein. In, in 1985, uh, this paper sort of launched the field of comparative methods. Uh, this is a paper that's so cited that people write papers about how much this paper is cited. <laughs> so anyway, with no further ado, we're all ready to hear what Joe has to show us for the next directions of phylogenetics. Thank you. I'll try to stand here and not move because this thing is pointing at me. Um, I um, am honored to give the uh, Storer lecture and I was thinking about, uh, I sort of looked up Storer and I was thinking that name sounds familiar. Um, and then I remembered that as far as I can tell my um, elementary biology course in uh, the University of Wisconsin in 1960 used Storer's book, so maybe there is a connection. Uh, I, I cannot say I learned my biology from it because I already knew some biology by then. Uh, am I showing up on the mic? I am, okay. Um, what I wanted to do is give you one of those talks that you've heard a lot of where somebody comes through and they talk about three things they've been doing lately in their lab and around it they spin a totally bogus framework <laughs> which makes out to, to, to define the central problem for biology in our time that just happens to be satisfied by these three projects that they just happen to have been collection have been the central results for evolutionary quantitative genetics. Um, when you have characters changing up a lineage and co-varying with each other so that you have uh, length and width covarying, or rather trivially. Well, everybody can see that one of the major sources of that covariation is genetic covariances. That basically there will be genetic variations, say simply ones that make the organism larger, that will affect both of those traits uh, in a correlated way. And uh, so if you see covariances or correlations between characters, you're likely to say, oh yeah, that's genetic covariation. But not so fast, because there's another source of covariation, and it's very important to keep it in mind. I have been howling in the wilderness about this for over 20, for almost 25 years, saying, look, folks, you've got to understand this. I have not noticed much reaction yet. Um, there's another force called selective covariance. It was actually first defined by um, the, I believe it was Danish, maybe, um, quantitative genetics geneticist Olaf Tedin in 1926 and uh, G. Ledyard Stebbins who was here of course uh, at Davis at the end of his career. Um, <coughs> G. Ledyard Stebbins in his great book of 1950 Variation and Evolution in Higher Plants um, cited Tedin's work and said look there's selective covariation too and what that is is basically you can have environmental conditions <coughs> that select changes in two or more traits in correlated directions. I mean, a classic example would be that when an organism moved, when its lineage somehow moves into the Arctic, it might be naturally selected to have, to have a larger body, relatively shorter limbs, and, and darker coloration. Um, and those are um, Berg, uh, Bergman's, Allen's, and Globler's rules. Um, and they don't mean they'll create a cross of phylogeny where some lineages have become uh, into, have gone into the Arctic and some haven't. They'll create across this phylogeny uh, a correlation between the changes of those traits, even though the traits may have no genetic covariation whatsoever. So this kind of, of selective covariance is, is highly important to keep in mind because it'll prevent you from naively equating covariance that you see across a phylogeny. Uh, with genetic covariation, and it, it causes some uh, some difficulties of interpretation, but well to keep it in mind. Okay, the first project I'm going to talk about is with Fred Bookstein. Fred is some of you who have encountered morphometric working on in their lab. So I'm going to, you know, with that warning, uh, there is a little aspect of this, but I think the uh, work will hold together. I'll necessarily have to whiz rather quickly through a lot of it, um, and. 
the phrase, the, the title is statistical non-molecular phylogenetics. Can molecular phylogenetics illuminate morphological evolution? Obviously, the answer is going to be yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here giving the talk. And uh, what I want to do is uh, to tell you a little bit about situations in which we have a molecular phylogeny. And this molecular phylogeny uh, is assumed to be pretty perfect, fairly, fairly good. Uh, it really tells you what the uh, divergence uh, times and uh, the topology, tree topology for the group is. We also have quantitative character data or other types of morphological data. And the question is, how can you um, make those work together with the molecular phylogeny? Now, we know that for comparative method studies, people have been doing that for a long time, as Carl mentioned. Um, and uh, that seems to be something that people actually want to do. I'm going to talk about um, three extensions of that kind of framework. One of them is the situation where your data are not just um, morphological measurements, but are uh, a morphological form, a morphometric form analyzed by morph morphometric methods. The second will be when you have fossil data on fossil species that are not, um, for which you don't have any, mo uh, any molecular data, but those fossil species are inside of a group or where you have present day species um, with molecular data and morphological data. And the question will be, how can you figure out where those fossils hook into the phylogeny? And the third problem will be, can you make models for discrete morphological characters that are 0, 1, but that work together with the continuous morphological characters. So with that, th with that sort of uh, framework, let me start out by saying that the, the central um, model that most people use for the evolution of morphological characters, say measurable characters, on a phylogeny is a Brownian motion model. Um, and you're basically saying that any given scale that you measure if you follow it through time on a lineage, it will wander back and forth on its scale according to some kind of Brownian motion process with some variance through time. If you have multiple characters, you're going to have different rates of change in the different characters.